Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to grab them and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, we're going to begin this morning in kind of a, uh, a new, I guess, mini-series, if we want to call it that. It's basically two weeks, and we're going to look at one of the most important and I would say profound scripture passages in all of the Bible. And it, um, it became a foundation and a legacy for generation after generation after generation. So much so that if you and I would have grown up in the home of an Orthodox Jewish family, even today, one of the first things we would have learned as a little boy or a little girl would have been this thing called the Shema. And Shema literally means here. We'll read it in just a minute. But it's something that you would have started your day with every morning, saying the Shema. Something you closed your day out with every day, saying the Shema. And it still happens, in, again, in Orthodox Jewish homes across the world. And so why would we then dive into this? Because Jesus was the one who would affirm this later in what became known as the Great Commandment. And even more than that, this passage teaches us, as Jesus then affirmed later, a whole lot about this covenant God who loves us and wants a relationship with us. And then it shows us exactly what we are to do then in response to that. And so I want to invite you this morning to stand with me, if you would, in honor of reading God's word in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and we'll read through 9. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You can have a seat. This morning, we're going to look specifically at verses 4 and 5, and then next week, next Sunday morning, we'll look at, at 6 and beyond. But as we, as we peer into this, before we get into the text, it's good to know the background and a little bit of the story of what's happening here and what Moses is doing. This is the Again, one of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And so Moses is, has penned this, and he's literally saying these words to the people of Israel. So Deuteronomy literally means second law or the second giving of the law. They're at the end of their journey through the wilderness, the people of Israel are, and they're about to go into the promised land. And this is Moses giving his final words. It would be one of those moments where, you know, the last thing that you could say to encourage this people that you have given your heart and soul to lead over the past 40 years. And so it's the re-giving of this law. And he gets to this chapter 6, and he begins to talk about really adhering in their hearts to the things he had spoken of in chapter 5, which was the Ten Commandments. So when it says in verse 6 of these words, chapter 6, verse 6, what it means is it goes back to what their minds would have just heard, that he reiterates the Ten Commandments to them. And so, and so we're not in any way confused. When you would have heard the Ten Commandments, particularly 40 years after they had been given on Mount Sinai, it wouldn't think necessarily of just kind of a plaque or a picture on the wall at the church, right? Some of us who might say Ten Commandments, oh yeah, that's the thing that, you know, we're in front of courthouses sometimes or used to be or however that kind of plays out, right? So those are the Ten Commandments. We get it. It's part of the old law. No, for them, it would have made this memory that was seared in them of them standing before the very God who rescued them from Israel, I mean from Egypt with all of these plagues and wonders. And they're standing now at the base of Mount Sinai and there is thunder and lightning and it's this incredible display of God's power and awesomeness. So much so that the people literally said, Moses, we would much rather hear from you. Let God speak to you and you speak to us than us hear from God directly. Because there was incredible fear in the display of power. And so when they hear the Ten Commandments, their mind goes to an awesome, delivering, powerful God. And they've been through a lot the last 40 years in the wilderness. And so we kind of get to this point as Moses is encouraging and challenging them as they're about to go through the toughest thing they're going to face, walking in to the land of promise 
and having the faith to trust God that he is who he says he is and he'll do what he'll say he will do. And really today, the Shema is all about faith and obedience. And so verse four, we get to see the God who we get to place our faith in. And then in verse five, how do we then respond to who that God is? So diving in, chapter six, verse four, it says, hear, O Israel. And that first phrase, hear, O Israel, that's where that word Shema comes from. That's the Hebrew word for hear. It also can kind of take the connotation of listen. And so you've probably had an experience in your life where maybe a teacher or maybe you as a parent or when you were a kid, your parents who kind of said, listen, right? And it makes your mind focus in on what is about to happen. And that's exactly what's happening in the text. Moses is saying, listen, hear, because what's about to come next is really, really important. And so it focuses their minds and their hearts as one who has authority to speak into their lives. It's different when you don't have that authority. So uh, when I was uh, first starting out in ministry, I was an intern at a large church not far from here, and we were going to children's camp. For some reason, I was a youth intern. I know I love students, um, but children I wasn't sure about, right? Children being under seventh grade, like they were scary. And so... I remember there was this deal where if you became an intern at this church, you had to go to children's camp as a counselor. Like there was no option. Not a good idea. So we went and, and literally there was myself and three other guys and we were all about the age of 21, 20, 21, 22, around there. And they put us in charge of a cabin of 40 some odd fourth graders. Yet none of us obviously had kids, right? And so surely they'll be able to curtail these fourth graders and it was a room just full of bunks and all of this. And so I remember by the end of day one, we had screamed to where we were losing our voices. <laughs> and they would not listen, right? I would, we would yell the words listen or any word that we think would maybe get their attention. And so we were exhausted. We went downstairs. The sixth graders were under us. And, there was, and they were, like we walked in and it was just one of those scenes that made you sick because everything was peaceful. Their bunks were in place. And they had one sponsor in there. And so we talked to him, we looked at him, he was a dad, just a normal good guy. He said, hey, can you help us? We need help. And so he came upstairs with us, and he walked in the room, and he said, <clears throat> excuse me. And the whole room went quiet. <laughs> and we're like, we just yelled at them for 30 minutes, and they wouldn't move, and all of a sudden the room goes quiet. And he spoke to him and said, listen. And then he laid out the law. And it was the deal of authority. It's what he had in their lives. And for whatever reason, the kids could sense fear in us. <laughs> and they could sense faith and strength in him. And so in a very real way, Moses, this man who has led them through so much, looks and says, listen. So the first thing we get is that our ears should be attentive to what's coming next, to what God wants to show us, to what he wants to teach us. These commands these things that are important. But then there's something else that happens in this, and that we understand when he says hear, and he's speaking through this guy named Moses, and he's given us these words, which means these are these commands, that the very God of the universe who calls us to listen has spoken. Now let that sink in for just a moment, that he is the God who speaks. If we lived in that time period, that would have been profound. Because here's how it typically went. So I want favor in my life. And, and by the way, that point, they were smart enough to know, and I do mean smart enough to know, that they didn't create themselves. And it wasn't just an explosion that happened. They understood that there had to be a creator from the world. They looked around them. In some ways, they get things more right than we do. But what they had was this idea, okay, something had to happen. Something had to create us. We couldn't just appear. So we're going to worship something. So we, we need life to go well. We need our crops to, to flourish. And we need water. We need those things for life. So when things go good, we know we're doing something right. So we'll craft these gods out of wood and stone. And then if things go well, you know, we'll pray to them. And if it's right, then, okay, we got this one right. Uh-oh, so something happens and the crops are destroyed. Well, now what? Now he must want some kind of a sacrifice, right? So we'll give some kind of a sacrifice. For a while, that's enough. But then something else happens in life, and that's not enough anymore. So we'll give something else, some kind of other sacrifice. And it went down, 
as human nature does, more perverse and more sickening to the point where the land they were about to march into, it was not uncommon for the Canaanites to literally sacrifice their own children on the altar of Baal for favor from that God. And so gather this, get our thoughts around this for a moment, that the God who speaks literally said, I am the one true God, and here is how you relate to me. No more chaos. No more wonder if your sacrifices are enough. No more trying to figure out if you've appeased this God well enough for him to show favor to you. No, I love you, and I've spoken, and here is how you relate to me. It makes all those commands that sometimes we read, sometimes we read about in Leviticus, and we go, what in the world? Why was God telling them that? Why can't they wear shirts that are two different cloth, right? It would drive us crazy. Dry fit would go out of business. So when we look at that, we understand then God was providing order in a world that had none. And all of a sudden, you have a God who speaks into his creation and says, I love you. Now relate to me. I want you to love me. I want to show you who I am. I have good plans for your life. And you get for the first time in history the one true God who speaks into his creation and makes it distinct from every other false God in the world. You know what's great about that? Is he is still a God who speaks. He's still a God that loves his people. Now, we understand it even more fully through the New Testament that we get this thing called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we come to place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Literally, the Spirit comes to indwell us, and he convicts us, and he speaks to us. And his primary method that he will speak to us in life is through his words. Think that the God of all creation who spoke the world into existence has literally penned his words and saying, here's who I am. Know me. And we get that in the Bible. And so we get to spend time and understand and grow to know a God who speaks. Hear, O Israel. But he goes on after that. The passage goes on. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord, that first phrase there, if you read it in your Bible and you see in your translation, most of them do this, where they capitalize all four of those letters, even though they're a little bit smaller than the capital L, the other three are. And what that means is that's the, the covenant name of God, the name Yahweh. So for most Hebrews, they would not, the covenant name of God was so holy, they wouldn't even speak that name. So if you were saying the Shema as you would every morning, it's Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elonehu, Adonai Echad. And I'll stop there because I don't really know the rest. So, so but he would say Adonai Elonehu. Adonai was not Yahweh. Adonai is the general term for God because a good Hebrew would not speak that name. It is too holy. And so we see the reverence for God. And so hear, O Israel, the Lord. And in that name is the God who is faithful because he's the covenant God. He is the God who chose to make a nation where there was not when he went to Abram and he called him out and he said, I'll make you Abraham. And though you're old already and you're going to get older before you have a child, I'm going to create descendants from you that will number, outnumber the sand on the seashore and the stars in the skies. Look up. That's what's going to come from you because I am making a great nation through you for my purposes and for my glory and for your good. And then he has one son, Isaac, who has a son, Jacob, and he becomes known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, establishing this covenant. And there's so much more we could go into there, but it goes down the road until it gets to this guy named Joseph, and God saves the nation, this family, through Joseph, and they go to live in Egypt and spend 400 years in Egypt, where they eventually become slaves, and they were getting rescued from this through a guy named Moses. In Exodus 3, God calls this guy named Moses, who was 80 years old at the time. I'm sorry, 40 years old at the time. No, 80 years old. That would have been about right. 80 years old at the time in Exodus 3, 13 through 15. And here's what he says. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, say to this people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations because God doesn't change. He is I am. That word Yahweh is linguistically I am. And to think about a God who says, there is no name that can really capture me. There, do not make an idol. Do not make an image. It doesn't work. No, I am. It is a statement of sovereignty, of preeminence, of timelessness. Before creation, I am. After all of this that we know ends, I am. In the middle of it, I am. And for our life, in the middle of all of the stuff that's going on, I am. That we can trust a God who is sovereign and trust a God who is good. That covenant name speaks. Do we trust him in that way? Do we revere this God? I am. Because he's the one true God. It goes on, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, and he says, Our God, and I know we're going through this slowly, but it's so rich to get into this, our God. And what does he mean by that? Well, it goes back to that, O Israel, that he has called a people out of nothing, and they are his people, and now his people are designed and destined to be a light to the nations around him. We see it even so more fulfilled in the New Testament with the people that are called the church, the literal body of Christ. That we are a we, not individualistic. And don't get me wrong, we are individuals, but we are individuals with gifting to strengthen one another, to do life in such a way that we challenge, that we encourage, that we walk with one another, and that we share the gospel and community together so that the world would look on at the church and go, there's something different there that I want to be a part of. And so sometimes we get that mixed up because one of our core values as Americans is this rugged individualism, right? What's right for me is for me. I'm good. I got, I'm looking out for number one. In a Hebrew mindset, and I would say in a biblical mindset, it's more like this. If you can imagine it this way, we live life. If there were a jar right here and it were full of marbles and every person is a marble, and you drop one marble in the top of it, they kind of rattle a little bit, right? But they don't affect each other. It's still separate marbles. A better worldview that's biblical is this, that we're a spider web, which means we are all interconnected. And it means when you struggle and one of those strands gets broken, you know who it affects? All of us. When we rejoice, you know who gets to rejoice? All of us. Because we do this thing in the body of Christ called we. We are the church under the head of Jesus Christ. And so the Lord, our God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God. And it gets to this last phrase. The Lord is one or the Lord alone. He's the one true God. And both, both of those are accurate. And not only is it, is it accurate in the sense that it's monotheistic, that's one of the implications there that for the first time in history, there is one God. There's not a God of this geographical region or this area or this thing or this part of life or aspect of it. I mean, you can look at the Roman pantheon or the Greek pantheon or all these different multitude of gods and says, no, there is one true God And not only is there one true God, but because he is one, he is also one in purpose, which means the people he has called have one purpose in life, to worship and to follow him. So what does that mean for us? This is such great news, that your life and my life has meaning. For the first time in history, as the Jewish people would recite this hero, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one embedded in that is this reality that the people matter. You matter. Your story matters. God loves you and has plans for your life, plans to use you for his glory and for your good, that our purpose is embedded in who he is not just because we're a breathing person on the planet. Does that make sense? As he breathes life 
that we have purpose in him. He's the one true God. So understanding this God that then is described in Hebrews, I'm sorry, in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It then begs this natural response that comes from it in verse 5. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And that you is to the nation, it's to the people, it's to us. And said, You shall love the Lord your God. And he's our God. Think about when the disciples asked Jesus to pray and they said, Matthew chapter 6, Lord, teach us to pray. And he says, our Father who art in heaven. That God so wants a personal relationship for us to walk with him in a way that we would know him as our Father. Again, profound. That he's our dad who wants to give us the good things of life that we need. Sometimes they're not things that feel good. Sometimes they're the things that hurt, the discipline, but they're the things that will make us more and more like Jesus, the things that will let us fulfill who he's designed us to be for the purposes he's given us. Our Father. That it's a God that we can possess even of our own, that we are his children. Love the Lord your God. And I want to focus on this word love for a minute. Because how do we begin to understand that? And I think the best way, it's been said before this way, that God's love language is obedience. God's love language is obedience, which means the way we communicate love back to God is through us knowing who he is and following him in his steps. We see that several places. Deuteronomy 6, right after this very chapter, or these very verses that we're studying this morning, verse 17 and 18, it says, You shall diligently keep the commands of the Lord your God and his testimonies and statutes, statutes which he commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Obedience, follow, 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 listen, hear, and follow. Jesus emphasizes this in John 15, 10. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You will remain in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. God's love language is our obedience. How do we express love back to God? How do we love the Lord our God? Through our obedience. Now hear this, because we've got to be so clear on it. What that doesn't mean is that our obedience earns God's love toward us. Right? Even in this passage in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, he was talking, Moses was talking to the people, and he wanted to be clear that it's not their righteousness that has won them the favor of God for the promised land. It says in 9.4, do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, which is the other people, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord was brought, has brought me in to possess the land. It wasn't their righteousness at all. It was God's work and favor and decision and determination in that moment. It wasn't because they had earned it and said, okay, now these people are good enough to be my people. It wasn't then, and it's not now. Ephesians clears that up for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, it says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses or in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. The gospel message is clear that we walk up to God in our sinfulness that has separated us from him. And he desires so much to have a relationship with us that he sent his very son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life, showed us how to live with God, how to communicate with the Father, and then went to the cross taking our sins upon himself. Not because we earned it, because there's nothing we could do, but simply because he loved us and he took our sins and he nailed them to the cross and he defeated sin 
And he rose from the dead three days later and he defeated death. And the scripture clearly says in Romans 10, 9, that if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that we will be saved. Because he did the work. And then our response is obedience. And that response is our sanctification. It's the rest of our life played out, becoming more and more like Jesus. So how do we love him? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And really Hebrew thought the heart would have been the seat of intellect, kind of those rational decisions. That soul uh, would have been our, the will, our sensibilities, and our desires. And then our strength is the might, the things we put our hands to do. Uh, Mark even expands it later in Mark 12. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Kind of taking the Greek connotation that we're probably more familiar with if you will, parsing it out even further. And so all of those things, he's basically saying, with all of you, love the Lord your God. Now, if you're like me, there have been times in my life where I look at that and I go, great, I want to do that, but how do I practically do that? Right? Tomorrow morning when I wake up, how do I practically begin loving God with all of me? And so I want to give us four things this morning to kind of take away from this to look at, okay, these are things from the text that I can begin doing in my life in terms of loving him with all that I am, that this response to this amazing God in relationship that I begin to walk with him. So the first is this, build your relationship. How do I begin loving him? Build your relationship with him. It means wherever you are, whether this is a whole new thing for you, or whether you've been walking at this a long time, that we go back to the revealed word of God, the God who has spoken. Say, God, show me your ways. Show me who you are that I may follow you. And then we begin to pray. We just begin to talk to God. Because as our Father, he wants to hear from us what's going on in our life. It's not that we're filling him in on something he doesn't know. It's that we're beginning to have a relationship with him. The two of the simplest things, there are so many other spiritual disciplines we could talk about, but if, if as, as followers of Jesus, we would just each day go to his word and say, God, show me what you want, to, you want me to see, and then begin to pray and to pour out our heart to him, it would change our lives dramatically. So build that relationship is the first thing. The second is this, that we remain aware what I mean by that is aware of our own brokenness and then our openness to what God wants to do next in our lives, that we remain aware. I think one of the easiest ways, at least for me, to begin to apply this, and really it flows perfectly with love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, is a, a process, or not a process, a, a thing called mikvah. So mikvah is something that Hebrews would have done. It developed later in the time period um, really where there were synagogues and all of that. And what a mikvah is, it's like a um, ritual bath. So it goes about this deep, and you would step down into it, and the water gets deeper as you step down. And again, it would come up about this high. And you would walk into a mikvah before you would go into the temple in Jerusalem. They've uncovered uh, dozens of them around the temple or into a synagogue or anything like that. And it would be a ritual cleansing. There's nothing magic about the water, but what you would do is walk in, and you would cleanse your head, your heart, your hands, and your feet. And so what I would not suggest is building a mikvah at your home in your backyard. But instead, as you go before the Lord, think about it this way. God, here are some thoughts that I've had that are not aligned with your thoughts. God, forgive me for really making my life a little bit more about me yesterday, being prideful in a situation at work. God, forgive me for thoughts that are clearly sinful that I didn't capture in my own mind. God, would you have my mind today? Would you fill me with the things that are worthy to think about? Our head, then we go to our heart. God, I have a lot of desires and passions in my heart and not all of them are right before you. Some of them are selfish. Some of them even look good, but really they're motivated from a place that's more about me than it is about you. God, would you cleanse my heart and God, would you reorient my passions and my desires to be your dreams, not mine? And 
would you align my life to yours? So our head, our heart, and then our hands. God, everything that I put my hands to do today, that could be whether you are working uh, outside in some job where, where, where you're out in the heat all day. It could be when you're in an office typing at a computer. It could be traveling. It could be anything that you do. It could be at home and the work that you're doing uh, at your house. It could be anything like that. God, whatever you put my hands to do today, would they bring glory to your name? And Father, I confess where they happen. And then my feet. God, let me walk in a way to every place that I go that not just bring, that brings glory to your name, yes, but God, that also puts me in places of mission for you. It puts me in places where I get to share the gospel with others. My head, my heart, my hands, and my feet. So we remain aware of our own brokenness before God. The third thing is this, that we would focus outward. So Jesus, when he takes this passage, and he would have, again, recited the Shema often in his life. And uh, we even see it a couple of times. I mentioned one in Mark, but also in Matthew, he gets quizzed by one of the lawyers there and, and says, so what is the greatest commandment? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And he says, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus brings in this incredible second piece, the second commandment, if you will. Now, they knew this, the Hebrew people, but it was not practiced well. They knew it because Leviticus 19 is all about loving your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus brings it in. I love the way Titus, Paul writes to Titus, and he says this in Titus 3.8. And he says, you can get so caught up in dissensions, in debates, and all these things, but let your life be such that there are good works proceeding out of it always. That you'd be devoted, is the word he uses, to good works. And so we're focused outward. We do that by upholding justice, by serving others. And here's the best, by living and sharing the gospel. That we begin to see our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends as opportunities to invest in an eternal future in their lives. And so we love them in that way. We focus outward. And finally is this, practically the last thing, is that we follow our example. And our example is Jesus. I love this about the Gospels, to think for just a moment that Jesus, not only did he come with a very purpose to die, to pay for our sins, and to rise again, to free us from the pain of death, but he also came to show us what it was like to walk on the planet, on a planet full of sin, and communicate with God, his Father, and how to interact around people who are sinners like us, right? And so how do we know what to do in specific situations? We go to the Gospels, we look at the life of Jesus. Who did he hang around? What did he spend his time doing? What were his priorities? And we look at the example that we've been given. Paul even said this later. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. So we have the example of Jesus practically in our lives. It is no wonder why the Shema was spoken every night and every morning. That the first thing we would get up and say, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And today, let us be a people who love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. Would you bow your heads with me? Just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to give you a moment just to maybe pray a simple prayer. God, what are you speaking to me today? What do you want to do in my heart? In just a moment, we're going to pr I'll pray, and we'll have a time of response. And I just want to encourage you, if there's something that God's stirring in you, and it may be joining a church, it may be you realize this morning that you don't know this Savior and you want to know him and place faith and trust in Jesus. But it also just may be something that's on your heart heavy that you need someone to walk with you and pray with you. I just want you to know we're going to be down here, myself, some of our pastors. We would love the opportunity in any way that God leads you to respond for you to respond. 
Father, we are so grateful for your love. God, we are grateful that you are a God who is worthy to be worshipped, that you are a God who speaks and who is faithful, and a God who provides purpose and meaning in life. Thank you for calling us to be your people. And God, Lord, as you're speaking to us now, Father, would you draw us near to you? Would you make us more like Jesus? And would you give us the passion to live for you in obedience? That we would love you with all that we are. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.